All right, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. Matt's going to be speaking to us today about hiding in plain sight, disguising HTTPS traffic with domain fronting. Take it away, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Matt. I'm a uh, software developer. Um, come here my first time at DEF CON. Um, can everyone uh, hear me up the back? I heard there's some uh, sound issues, but lots of thumbs in the air. Thanks very much. Cool. So a lot of um, a lot of us have probably heard about domain fronting. It got a fair bit of attention recently when Signal Messenger made some noise when I think Google said, "Hey, we're going to put an end to this." Um, so there was lots of questions about what is it. There was uh, an academic paper floating around, which uh, I don't really understand how to read papers like that. Um, so I asked my friend to help me out, and he explained it to me, and um, I sort of figured it out. So I thought, let's uh, bring it here and explain it uh, in simple terms to maybe people who don't even necessarily know what TLS is um, or just have rough understanding. So I will be maybe to some people going to a, a, a basic level. Um, that way more people can understand. So hopefully uh, we get the right balance. So um, what is it? I, I put on my dictionary writer hat and uh, sort of tried to come up with a dictionary definition and it's um, abusing an implementation detail of shared infrastructure to disguise the true destination of a HTTPS transaction. So um, there's, a few, there's a few key words in here. Uh, implementation detail is one big one and shared infrastructure is another. And we'll, we'll go into why these, these parts are important later. And HTTPS, as far as I know, there's probably not really any other protocols that share uh, different paths to different things within the same place that connections get terminated at. Um, domain fronting is not new. It's been around for quite a while. It didn't do an exhaustive search, but uh, it has, uh, this is the oldest thing I could find that uses it. It's uh, some kind of proxy that's uh, written in Python and um, it's some the code, the code off GitHub, there's the commit message says abstract host substitution. Um, maybe that's the old name for it. Um, cool, so let's look at some of the advantages of domain fronting. Um, what? <laughs> Sorry, I messed that up. Sorry, uses domain fronting. I mentioned uh, Signal Messenger. They primarily seem to use that for bypassing censorship. Um, Lantern seems to do the same. I think that's some kind of a, a VPN. Um, and then there's uh, Meek Client, which is an OBFS proxy for Tor. Um, I presume pretty much everybody here has heard of Tor, which is usually used for, you guessed it, bypassing censorship, um, but also um, for evading detection. So uh, the OBFS proxies, there's different plugins for Tor, basically, that let you pretend you're different types of traffic. Um, all kinds of interesting ones. I wish I could go into them today, but that, that's a huge rabbit, rabbit warren. Um, and then malware. They'll be bypassing censorship. Obviously, censorship isn't just a country saying, no, you can't go to this uh, website. That's also corporations saying, no, you're not going to Facebook at work. Um, and also evading detection. Malware doesn't want to be going to, hey, you just got hacked.com. And so, advantages. Why is it useful? Well, it, uh, it can't be detected without breaking TLS. Um, someone has to actually perform some kind of a man in the middle attack in order to be able to see that you're doing that. Um, so, so, one potential case here would be if I'm, in, if I'm run in a corporate network which doesn't want to invade the privacy of their staff by intercepting their TLS communications, um, I won't be able to tell that this is happening. So uh, you know, maybe a piece of malware could use it to, to, to evade my firewall from detecting it. Um, it uses existing infrastructure on the server side. So when I've been playing around with this, it's uh, mostly CDNs like uh, CloudFront and um, not Cloudflare anymore, and uh, not Google Cloud anymore either, more on the... <laughs> And uh, it's compatible with anything that can be tunneled over HTTPS. So if you can think of a way of tunneling your traffic over HTTPS, you could use domain fronting to, uh, to send that traffic around. 
And it's, it's very simple and easy. It sounds complicated, but once you, once you realize how simple it is, you'll, you'll just walk away and go, cool, I'm gonna go do that at home. It'll take you five minutes. Okay, where is it not useful? Um, bypassing censorship where the TLS is man in the middle. So if I break your TLS session, I can see you doing this. I said that before. Um, and it's not useful for hiding web traffic in a normal web browser. You can, you can do it in a normal web browser, but the, each web page you go to is going to load things from all kinds of different places. You need to uh, find suitable domains to hide behind, and not every website would have domains that match. We'll, uh, so yeah, it needs to be on a shared infrastructure, and uh, the front domain for that, that destination needs to be known. So uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by front domain uh, a bit later when I go into the demo. <clears throat> cool. Oh, and the security is void. Uh, the reason for that is you need to basically trust a different certificate to where you're actually talking to. Um, again, we'll see more in the demo. So how does it work? Um, well, let's uh, go back to the days of HTTP 1.0, and you know, you, obviously, when your your web browser was doing you're trying to browse to www.mywebsite.com and uh, you do a DNS lookup, your, D your DNS server returns the server address and you connect to that web server and say, hey, get me the home page and it returns it. The problem here, of course, is we needed one IP address per domain we were hosting. So if you wanted to host both, you know, website A.com and website B.com, you needed to have two different IP addresses and some of us couldn't do that uh, or, you know, and then we obviously want many millions of websites, maybe we would run out of uh, IPv4 even faster than we currently are. Um, so they introduced the host header. So basically that just changed this uh, sequence diagram slightly. Well, not at all really. It just added this extra piece of information on the, uh, on this, the second green arrow here where we just specify, hey, I want to go to website A or website B. That way, that way we could share that uh, IP address across both of them. But it's 2018 and we encrypt web traffic, or we're supposed to. So, uh, you know, we, this thing called TLS, I guess, was its original name. Uh, sorry, SSL was its original name and uh, now known as TLS. Um, basically, it just takes HTTP as it was, wraps it in a secure layer that validates, you know, where, where you're talking to. In some cases, it can validate you yourself if you decide to do bi-directional authentication. Um, you know, am I talking to my bank or am I talking to someone that claims to be my bank? You know, it takes care of that for you. And it encrypts the traffic between you and the server, as we know, <clears throat> and without, without changing the protocol. So as the application developer, it doesn't matter if I'm using HTTP or if I'm doing IMAP or POP or whatever, you know, TLS was designed to just go over the top. However, Sorry, getting ahead of myself here. So TLS handshake is pretty complicated and I don't understand anything but the first two that's happening there. And, and, I don't, and it's not, not relevant for domain fronting. Basically what happens here is uh, your TLS handshake, your, your client says, hey, I want to talk TLS. And then the server goes, sure, I am your bank. Definitely your bank, not someone else. And they do some kind of uh, special packet dance and arrive at some uh, encryption keys that they both agree on. And from, from there, everything gets encrypted, right? So it's a layer, it's hidden from me as the application developer, but uh, everything from that point is encrypted and as the application developer, it just looks like the same protocol that I came up with, in this case, HTTP. So forget about all that stuff that I don't know, and we pretend it's not there, and just focus on the first couple of messages. Now, if I'm, if I'm sitting on a network watching your traffic, okay, so maybe I'm at your Starbucks Wi-Fi, maybe I'm your ISP, maybe I'm a government, maybe I'm your, uh, your sysadmin at, at your company, I can't see what's happening down the bottom here. Um, th that part's encrypted, obviously. But, what I can see is 
at this, these, first, these first few messages are unencrypted. The client hello actually has a part at the beginning that says, hey, I want to go to google.com. And the reason for that is because at the beginning, when we, when we look back at our HTTP 1.0 versus uh, HTTP 1.1 is, I've totally messed this up, I'm sorry. <laughs> The, the reason for this is when I say, hey, I want to talk to TLS, the server immediately needs to know who it is representing. So if I have website A and website B both on the same server and my client says, hey, I want to talk TLS, I need to send it back a, back a certificate to say, hey, I'm website A or website B. So that meant TLS had to be extended slightly to identify which server we're talking about. Now, am I talking to google.com? Am I talking to yahoo.com? So that got, it's an SNI extension. So I, um, I think, when did the Xbox 360 come out? Uh, that didn't support it. I just know that if you, if you want to support Xbox 360, it doesn't support this. You need to have one IP per. Um, so that's roughly how long ago it got introduced, but it wasn't a standard thing. So say I'm, I'm on your network, I'm sniffing your traffic, and I'm watching you use uh, HTTPS. I can see that you're going to google.com because it's sitting there in that very uh, first message that you send in your TCP session um, to Google. So just to, just to recap that, the entire contents of the HTTP session are encrypted, um, which is all that stuff. Um, for web developers, maybe early on, certainly early on in my web de development career, none of this was clear to me, like where all this stuff went. It just somehow magically arrived and then you got it from dollar post in PHP somewhere. Um, and then what's not encrypted is the domain name of the server we're talking to. That's exposed by SNI. So that's how you're, even though you're using HTTPS, your ISP can see what you're, what you're looking at. And the server certificate also is encrypted, and I can't remember, but I think TLS 1.3 is supposed to encrypt the server certificate. Anyone here? No, no, no. It does. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, cool. So let's take a look at HTTPS stacks. So with domain fronting, what's important about uh, or what makes it work is the implementation of the HTTPS stacks and how they usually get shared across uh, customers. Say, if you're using Amazon CloudFront. So very simple single server stack, like let's say I'm, uh, when I was 14, I used to run a web server under my, under my desk, which was just Apache, um, and it basically, it's this, this first thing on the left. So, sorry, first thing on the left is a client, and then we got the web server, which is like Apache, Nginx, IAS, whatever, and that pulls stuff from an origin. And that's generic because the origin can be a file system, it could be a, a Rails application, it could be a Django application, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, this is just to show the separation of concerns. So you see this web server is responsible for HTTP, HTTP TLS, and, and caching. Um, and when you're running one website, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all pretty simple. And yet, what we like to do, usually for performance reasons though, is delegate the TLS. So TLS is you know, reasonably heavy on the CPU and perhaps what you're doing in your application might be very heavy on the memory. So we often, often we split this out and this is often what's happening uh, at somewhere like CloudFront or Google Cloud where um, they have lots of customers and they want to have a very fast endpoint with an IP that lots of, many, lots of customers use that just does the job of terminating those TLS connections and getting them to the next link in the chain, which is um, the next web, web server that goes and then fetches the content. Um, and so when we've delegated it, this is where I can steal that little NSA graphic I, I love. Um, so. I, this is how, um, how I think Heroku kind of works. Is a, that's a shared infrastructure provider. I haven't tried if domain fronting works through Heroku yet. Um, that's probably something I'll do right after this. Um, but uh, you basically, you talk to that reverse proxy whose job is, hey, let's terminate the TLS here. 
And then it goes to something else whose job is uh, look at the host header in, in the request and route it to whichever one the host header matches. So what, what happens in these CDN networks uh, often is the reverse proxy decides what certificate to send back to the client um, based on the SNI header, that thing you saw in my Wireshark screenshot. And then the next link of the chain decides where to send it based on the host header, um, which they don't always have to match. And in domain fronting, they basically, we deliberately make sure they don't match. Um, so if we were to make, uh, I'm sorry, this is way too small to see on the screen, but if we were to make a request to www.good.com and say in my SNI header, hey, I want the certificate for good.com, then I get my TLS session established and then I say, okay, get me the home page and the host is www.evil.com. And what will end up happening is if that reverse proxy, that should satisfy the, the TLS session, then the router would sh look at the host header and go, ah, I want to go to evil.com. And uh, this seems to be roughly how it works behind the scenes at Amazon. Unfortunately, I don't work there. I don't know anyone that does. I wish I would love to know why it works there. Um, so I've already, I've already ruined that one. Um, and again, remi remembering what we saw in the, in the Wireshark, I would only see, if I'm sniffing the network, I would only see the packets going to good.com. Why does it work? Um, an anonymous Google software engineer said it worked because of a quirk of our software stack. Um, and Google has since done what they can to get rid of domain fronting. So it highly depends on implementation. Um, in order for it to work, the shared infrastructure must not check for a mismatch between SNI header and host header. Apparently that's what Cloudflare does to stop it and it kind of makes sense to do that. Um, and also, HTTP requests must be routed separately to how TLS, the TLS. So both those layers need to be dealt with separately. <clears throat> so to put it together, what do we need to actually do? All we need to do is connect like normal to one host and set the host header to another and they've got to be on the same infrastructure that can route between them. So we find evil.com needs to be accessible via the same infrastructure as something innocent looking. Um, and the infrastructure needs to have the right implementation quirks. So let's say there's plenty of websites on a, on a popular CDN, like uh, uh, jQuery is on a CDN. Um, and that same CDN I could go and sign up for myself and put my malware command and control server behind that that CDN, which would allow me to re use somebody else's domain who uses that same CDN to go there. <clears throat> and I keep giving away the. Um, yeah. So find it, finding them, there's, there's there's loads of websites there. If we go if we go to say Alexa top top 500, we should be able to just do reverse DNS lookups to you know uh, Google.com points to this whatever. Uh, this customer is using Akamai. I think Facebook uses Akamai. Um, also would be a good, another good one to try. And they're, they're easy to find and sign up for. Uh, cool. So what makes some domains better than others? Um, it depends really what we're trying to do. If we're evading detection like malware, we want to have something that looks pretty business as usual. You know, If, uh, if I'm in a company that sells uh, apples, it probably doesn't look very suspicious if I'm going to fruit.com. Um, or maybe something innocuous, you know, if, I'm, if I've infiltrated a, a company and I'm trying to exfiltrate some data and that company is also a marketing company that uploads a lot to YouTube, maybe I could hide my stuff through YouTube.com. If I'm in, a, in maybe a country that blocks, bl blocks access to sites, um, which is a which is signals problem, is uh, they, were, they were in a country which was blocking, blocking their messenger and they also apparently block websites. They chose a web, a, an e-commerce website which um, they thought would, be, would, would have collateral damage. Um, so if that country were to block that site, um, that, would, that would negatively impact um, that, that country as, as a whole, so perhaps, not be a, perhaps be a reason why 
that wouldn't get blocked. And then maybe you could do a combination of all. You can find something that's, you know, it looks like business as usual, it's innocuous, and it's got collateral damage. Probably a really good one to go with. So um, I've, I've talked a lot, and I'm gonna keep talking. <laughs> but instead of uh, boring slides, let's uh, fire up this SSH session, and I'm gonna try and talk and hold the mic at the same time. Uh, all right, one second. All right, so what we're gonna start with is uh, I, I have a root shell here and I'm gonna start off a, uh, a TCP dump so you can see the traffic that's actually leaving this machine. So it's a, this is just an, an empty EC2 instance in, in Amazon, so there's, there should be hopefully no other traffic on 443. Um, so this command here, for those not familiar with TCP dump, TCP dump uh, takes network traffic that's going through your network card and logs it somewhere. Um, and I'll just briefly go over the arguments here. Minus C4 means stop after I've seen four packets. And so there's three for, three for, the, TCP hand, three for the TCP handshake and then the fourth packet is our first message from client to server which is our client hello which has the SNI header in it. Uh, minus A means give me ASCII output, show it straight to the terminal. N is like a performance optimization, like don't do a reverse lookup to uh, the IP address. Um, and I, our interface, F0, and then we're looking for TCP port 443. So let's run that and then switch to another screen. And then we're just gonna run a curl to pick, pick some dot photos. It's like lorem ipsum, but for pictures. Um, so curl minus S just means uh, shut up, don't do anything except get that and give me the output to standard out. And then we're gonna pipe that to uh, MD5 sum so we can look at, okay, what was the content I actually saw? So the content I actually saw in this case, or the hash of it, is uh, you know, C8E, e, EAD. So the purpose of this is just basically go get me this web page, make a hash of it so I've got an idea of uh, what I saw, and then let's get another web page. So in this case, um, protectyourprivacynow.com, and obviously different hash. So these are the two hashes. And then what we're gonna do is, uh, take a look at when I, when I do a domain fronting, which, which one I get. So hopefully this makes sense. Now I just realized I've messed up my TCP dump. Okay, so only the first, only the first curl request got shown up, uh, only the first curl request got dumped here because uh, it stopped after four packets. So you can see right here, this is, um, this is my SNI header that says, hey, I'm going to pick some dot photos. And then let's run the TCP dump again and switch to the other screen and run, I'll just run this curl command here. So when I'm going to protectyourprivacynow.com, you can see on the other side, you've got in the same, roughly the same place, I'm going to protectyourprivacynow.com. All right. And it's in my history because I was testing it out. Cool, so basically, let's do some domain fronting and turn over to, let's get TCP dump running again. Okay, so uh, all we've done here is we're still establishing our TLS connection with protectyourprivacynow.com. Um, so you can see that most of this curl command is just the same as the one above it. The, different, the only difference here is we're telling curl with the minus H uh, flag, change the host header to pick some dot photos. And so when I run this, the, the MD5 sum of what came back is actually pick some dot photos, but if I go and look at the other side where I've uh, dumped the packets, it actually just shows protectyourprivacynow.com. Um, so when I said it was really easy and you can go and do it at five, in five minutes at home, there it is. Um, cool. cool, so uh, there's, there's a few risks here. Um, obviously one of them is 
the reliability. When I try going to protectyourprivacynow.com, I don't know that they're going to keep it on that same CDN as pixim.com. Uh, sorry, pixim.photos. Um, they could change that at any time and they could point it somewhere else. Um, so a potential solution to that is you could have a list of backup domains. If you were shipping an app that uh, relied on domain fronting, maybe you, you, you want to have a list of other ones that still work. Um, but a bigger problem is you can't validate that the server is authentic because if you're connecting to uh, protectyourprivacy.com but then really intending to talk to pixum.photos, the server you validated who you're talking to is protectyourprivacy.com, not the photo site that you're trying to go to. <clears throat> and, and also, since you're connecting to that place that you, don't, you didn't set up yourself, they could change that certificate or CA at any time, uh, so you can't pin it either, which you, you'd normally be able to do if it was you know, a, a self-signed cert or whatever. So also, the traffic's visible to the infrastructure provider. So say if you had traffic that you needed to hide from uh, Amazon CloudFront, for example, um, or, or it was sensitive, because you established your connection with site A, that infrastructure provider just by default uh, is able to see what, what you did. It's, uh, it's kind of obvious if you're used to using a CDN, but it's not that obvious sometimes when you when you do these tricks, I don't know, I, I guess I forget about all these sort of things. Um, and sensitive data could be stolen and malicious payloads could be injected. So basically, just treat it as an unencrypted connection. Encrypt and sign all your messages. Um, maybe come up with your own way of uh, validating that you're really talking to who you think you're talking to. Cool. So uh, I actually saw a DOS attack happen via domain fronting. It was a combination of uh, some not quite configured correct, uh, not quite correctly configured infrastructure and uh, domain fronting. So what happened was uh, we had a very, there was a very normal web server set up. You know, you start with one web server, you refactor your application, and you make it two web servers, and then you, you know, you, you, you eventually end up with a, a cluster of them, and then you end up going, okay, well, we need a CDN, and so it was put behind a CDN. Um, and so they marked the CDN IPs as trusted proxies to the web server, um, as, as you do, because obviously, TCP connection hits the CDN endpoint, and then the CDN makes another connection. Um, and then attackers found a nice slow web page, and they decided to make thousands of requests to it. But they used domain fronting, which in the case of the CDN that was being used, and uh, for some reason was going between two different IPs. So it was going from one CDN endpoint to another, and then to the web server, which it didn't expect. Um, so basically, a connection diagram would look like this. You get your client way over to the left, connects to a reverse proxy, that's one TCP connection, and the reverse proxy then connects to the web server. So normally, um, because the web server can only see the connection from 2222, which, so for those that can't see the, uh, the IP addresses, um, they're a bit small. So the web server sees the reverse proxy's IP address, from that actual TCP. So the reverse proxy usually adds uh, into the X forwarded for header, hey, I'm forwarding it for 1.1.1.1. And, and the web server knows that because the actual TCP connection comes from 2.2.2.2, that it can trust that 1.1.1.1 is really who it's talking to. Um, and that's what I just... So in, in this case, what, what was happening was the user was hitting uh, the, the front domain, the, the domain fronting domain that was hi being hidden behind. That added x forwarded for 1111. It uh, got forwarded to the other one, which added another x forwarded for header and then passed it up to the web server who didn't really understand that there could be more than one. Um, so uh, that allowed, that basically opened up an IP spoofing vulnerability um, because the web server was thinking that the user's true IP was in fact the IP of the CDN endpoint. Um, so it, what we expect to happen usually is that header has one address which is the true IP of the user 
or at least that's what the web server was expecting, and that the web server reads that header and it knows who it's talking to. In actual fact, there was two, it didn't understand it, and it assumed it assumed that the, uh, the CDN was the real user. It got worse because we had failed to ban configured and it ended up banning the whole CDN and taking the site out because it thought the CDN was dosing it. And uh, yeah, the root cause, mis misconfiguration, we'd forgotten, look at the, look at the full list. And uh, because it went through domain fronting, which is a, uh, a way that it wasn't expected to work, it invalidated that, that assumption. So in order to plug that, know your infrastructure. Um, X44 is actually a de facto standard. Your infrastructure provider might do it differently to how you expect. Um, I think Cloudflare, I think, has a, a, a different XCF connecting IP or something. It's completely different. And where, wherever there's a possibility to, to get pro proxied multiple times, make sure that uh, the, chain of your infra the chain is trusted. Um, so, you know, if you've got a, a CDN endpoint that maybe hits another one, that hits uh, a load balancer, that hits another load balancer, it needs to be able to draw a line between all those endpoints and go, ah, okay, I trust this one, which trusts that one, and, and find its way to the, the true IP. Um, so in that case, Nginx is, I, I don't know the other ones, unfortunately, but it's real IP recursive, if you want to Google that, um, and Cloudflow's header connecting IP. So the future of domain fronting, I don't think it'll last much longer. Um, Cloud, Cloudflare has already said um, they're getting rid of it. It can't be relied upon. Um, it's implementation details which could change. Uh, like I mentioned before, Amazon might just suddenly start doing something differently one day. Um, Netlify, Beluga, all those CDN providers, whatever you use, um, they might find a more efficient way of doing it or decide to get rid of it. Different regions of the world might use different infrastructure. Uh, I think I noticed this when uh, I was in China. I went to apple.com and I was like, oh, I wonder where that's going. And I had a look, it was completely different to the result I was getting from Perth. It was back in my one place and some other CDN elsewhere. So if you were writing something that needs to be used all over the world, uh, they'll be, they might be pointing to different infrastructure. Um, and it's also actively possible, sorry, it's possible to actively prevent it from working. Um, which is Cloudflare is deliberately doing this by checking for a mismatch between the SNI and host header. Or by using SNI for routing the request, if you remember the several layers of uh, where it decides on its final destination, um, it could just simply use the SNI header, which I believe was the intent behind uh, HTTP2. Um, Teams Unwanted, Amazon and Google uh, have uh, appeared to have responded to pressure against it. Uh, Google's already broken it deliberately. Amazon said they will. And Cloudflare, for some reason, says it's a risk to their customers. It would put our traditional customers at risk. Um, I presume that means people behind uh, corporate firewalls, because those corporate firewalls can't necessarily ban malware traffic if it's using domain fronting. Um, so, domain fronting maybe not that useful for making your own personal HTTPS more private. So, a couple more suggestions here. Uh, TLS 1.3 has explored the possibility of uh, encrypting the SNI component. It didn't make it into the spec because it required an extra uh, round trip in order to. There, there was there was actually two proposals. One was an extra round trip to negotiate a key first. Uh, the other one I think was based on a static key. I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, uh, um, however, I did read recently that there was, uh, there was work done on this uh, by Cloudflare, I think, and this was only in the last couple of days I think that came out. Um, use a conventional, conventional tunnel like a VPN if you set the tunnel up yourself. Uh, tunnel traffic other ways, there's, there's, other, there's other protocols out there for, for achieving this. Um, I've seen some pretty, obviously, Old school malware uh, command and control, IRC. Um, a friend of mine tried to do IP over Facebook Messenger. That was pretty horrible. Um, HTTP over XMPP. And uh, just coming up with uh, crazy, silly ideas can be, can be pretty fun. 
Um, but I, I hope you all walk away from here understanding you know, how SNI facilitates sharing uh, infrastructure um, that uses TLS, you know, working around that uh, problem of needing one IP per, per host. Um, how third parties can see uh, where your HTTPS traffic is, is going without doing a man in the middle attack. Um, how to find uh, domains and, and actually do domain fronting yourself. And, and also how to, how to protect yourself from uh, misconfigurations like, uh, like what I saw before, um, where basically the infrastructure just didn't do what, what was expected. Um, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, any, any questions?